can introduce Coach Ayers. He's been coaching track and field for 14 years, and twice he's been selected as the Orange County Track Coach of the Year. Uh, he first started coaching at Orange Lutheran High School, where he led his team to its first CF Division III championship. That was way back in 2013. After that, he went over to his alma mater at Tribuco Hills, and they haven't looked back. In fact, they've been the number one ranked team in Orange County four of the past five years. And during that time, uh, his athletes have set 31 grade level records, eight school records, and that includes a sizzling 41-24 in the 4 by one in 2018. So he knows his speed, the master of speed. Here we go. Uh, the topic for the evening is how to lift for speed without time or space and mass-specific force. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Coach JT Ayers. JT? Thank you. Thank you. Wow, really nice. <laughs> so um, never thought I would say this, but I just see a bunch of names and uh, no faces. I'm used to that. I'm a teacher, and this is literally my life right now. So I think I'm going to be comfortable. All right, I'm going to share my screen, and you may or may not see my face. Maybe you'll see my face in the corner. Um, I'm going to try to talk about something that for about 30 minutes that really warrants a whole lot of discussion and time. So if you have questions, please put them in the, uh, in the chat or anywhere that Tim and his team can get to. And if we don't get to it, just reach out to me on Twitter. I'll be happy to help more. Um, we've also done a very like larger, and I've partnered with another coach in Colorado and we'll talk about him during the presentation. He's a good friend of mine. And we did a more robust presentation of this one, including watching an athlete actually do the entire workout in its entirety. And uh, you can see the timing. You can see where it's happening, how it happens. Um, that's all on CoachTube. Just send me a, um, just reach out to me via email or on Twitter and I'll give you my information and I can give you more, including a link and, and a discount code and all that stuff. So um, we can make the world faster together. How about that? Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, here we go. So lifting for speed, uh, this is a thing and you can actually do this. And if you do it correctly, you're gonna see incredible gains out of all your athletes in any area of speed explosion. Um, two weeks ago, I was on the call or on a phone with um, a phone call with the University of Washington softball girls team. And they're implementing this system the way that I'm gonna lay it out for you. And they're ecstatic by it. And they actually told me not to tell anybody because uh, they want to win the Pac-12. And I said, I'm a UCLA fan, so deal with it. So, um, yeah, just real quick, you're going to see Christian McCaffrey uh, on here. Um, he implements the exact system that my athletes at Tropical Hills High School implement, and that's what I'm going to present to you now. So if, um, if you need any credibility, there you go. Your fantasy football team can thank me and Coach Kula for helping that young man be awesome. Um, okay. We need to just give context. So what are the three components for speed? Well, if you're going to think about speed, you have to think about how often you contact the ground, how much, much muscular force you can deliver during that individual ground contact, and then how much ground contact time is available during that force. So we're going to take this um, kind of foundational basic principle, and we need to apply that to everything that we do and what we do in the weight room needs to correspond to what we're going to be doing on the track and vice versa. Now, the reason why I even have this presentation is because there's two different ways that I have found that, whoops, I'm sorry, went too fast. There's two different kind of philosophies in the weight room that I was not satisfied with is because either, and I'll, I'll probably say this a couple other times, and I see it all the time, including at my school, and, um, and there's great coaches at my school too. Either you're going to go to the weight room with your track athletes and you're going to really understand nothing. You're, you don't know what to do. So you're just going to do activity. You're going to watch a YouTube video. You're going to print out something you found, a PDF on Google, and you're going to try to implement that. Maybe you're one of the rare few that has a strength and conditioning coach at your private Catholic awesome school, and they're going to do things. You should know what they're doing with your speed or uh, athletes that need to get faster, need to, uh, a pole vaulter, a jumper. Um, by the way, the system that I'm going to develop or, uh, kind of lay out for you is for, well, according to, uh, Barry Ross, who kind of implemented this and, and campaigned it with Peter Wayand, who's right here, 
is um, it's for the distance runner all the way down to the 100 runner and, and, and even shorter. So um, one philosophy in the weight room is we just go in there and we don't know what we're doing. Okay, so I'm going to hope, my hope is, and my goal of this is that you can have a better understanding about what you're doing and simple is better. You can do things in the weight room that are going to maximize force into the ground. And we're going back to those three components of speed. You will see your athletes get faster and you can measure them. Um, get a free lap device and measure them week by week or every other week or whatever you're going to do. And you're going to see your kids get faster. My program is a living proof of that. We do not get transfers. In fact, the kids that are great football players on the boys side, they go to other schools. So how are we fast and how do we continue to stay fast? It has to do a lot with the system of lifting. Um, the other uh, philosophy with, with lifting is um, a good place to flex your ego because you're all about gains and getting those LBs and we want our athletes to be big and no, no, you don't. And we're going to talk about why. So hopefully you can implement exactly. I want to make it very, very user-friendly um, and helpful. So faster top running speeds or achieve a greater ground forces, not more lay, uh, rapid leg movements. And um, just do a Google search on Peter Wayan. The guy is um, the, uh, I don't know, I would say the the force or even like the intellect on what it looks like to be fast and how you can achieve topper fast end or even acceleration. It's Peter Wayan. Um, pretty amazing guy. Okay. So type of muscle fibers, um, the type one muscle fibers, basically that slow twitch, slow oxidative type. And we don't want that. That's a distance runner that only goes slow. And we can argue till the cows go home that uh, distance runners should be implementing speed in some capacity with their workouts. And I'm sure you do that. But for a sprinter or anyone that wants to really explode and put force into the ground and move down the track or the football field or the soccer field or whatever it is, if you want someone to be faster, we need to get to the type 2B um, muscle fibers. So what are these? Well, these are glycolic muscles, fibers for fast twitch. You can develop these. So, I mean, I've gone, I went to a clinic when I was just starting out and they said, kids are just born this way. They either have fast twitch or they don't. And I just got back for having 45 youth kids at a park doing speed training. And a lot of those kids were not fast last March and they're faster, way faster. And I can even show you the data to just prove it. You can develop these. You can teach speed and speed is taught. Um, so maximum force production fibers and the largest potential increase in size and strength. So in the weight room, this is what we want to try to maximize. So they're anaerobic. So if they're anaerobic, we need to make sure we are not exhausting the muscle fibers. We're not tearing muscle fibers. Here's a video of one of my athletes a few years ago, uh, literally last set lifting, I think it's about 500 pounds and, uh, with the hexagon deadlift bar and he is tired, but you'll see that he dropped the weight. Let's see if I can do it again. I will explain why he drops the weight and how he decides to lift this way. Not the greatest form, but you know what? It was a good day. Um, okay. So how do you increase? Here's a video of Christian McCaffrey. Um, well, if you're going to increase the type 2B muscle fibers, you need to lift heavy. And you need to lift heavy often. So what's heavy? Um, heavy is 85% or above your max. And I want to say this now because this will be a question is, well, how do you figure out your max? Um, I've done it both ways. I've actually had kids sit down and we've, we figured out their one rep max. Um, I have moved away from that and I actually do not do their one rep max with a deadlift because I feel like it's a waste of a, of a lifting day. So we make educated guesses. I make educated guesses. Um, I don't let the kids do that. So um, if they're lifting at 90% or 95% at the very beginning, we'll start smaller and just make sure the form is correct. And then as time goes on and you're with these athletes um, often, you'll be able to figure out, okay, does that feel like 90%? Um, let's work on this weight for a while, then let's move you up. And um, I move them up gradually and slowly because quality is always better than quantity. So we want to increase, increase the, um, the type of muscle fibers that we want. We want to avoid hypertrophy and we want to do the right type. 
So the goal for speed in the weight room is to superior strength with minimal mass. And that's really important here. We do not want to add LBs like the greatest JV assistant coach of all, all time in football. We do not want people to gain weight. The heavy you are, the, literally the more gravitational pull you have on the earth, it's going to be a lot harder to run fast. Big people don't run fast. And we need to talk about what it looks like. And we've all had, I mean, I've definitely had uh, freshman sprinters come in and they're fast and they're good and you're excited about their future. And then they start gaining 20 to 30 pounds. Well, they're not going to be that fast anymore. And that has a lot to do with the way that they lift. So what is mass specific force or MSF? So that is, is a distinctive approach to the weight room in which the training goal is to increase strength levels without body weight. We do not want to add body weight. Um, it's going to happen naturally because the kids that we coach for the most part are going through puberty and growing in different lengths and, and sizes and all this stuff. But if we are lifting in the correct way, we're not going to add weight. So we want to increase the force applied to the ground in relation to the body weight. This improves stride length and stride frequency. And I wrote here because I had a, another coach called the Holy Grail to running faster. I thought that was really clever. I don't know about that, but I can tell you that if you do the right thing in the weight room in the right way, one, you don't need a lot. You don't need a huge facility. In fact, the other day, we're actually not even allowed to get into our weight room. So we brought the bars out. We have bumper plates. We brought those out and we were dropping on the cement. And we could even do it on the track, but I love my track and I don't want to drop anything on my track. Um, but you could, if they're bumper plates, you absolutely could. We don't need a, a, a lot of room. And um, so when we're talking about mass specific force, we need to do certain things in a certain way, but it's easy and it's simple. So I hope we're, you're trying to, and I'm throwing a lot at you right now. So, um, when we're talking about the way that we're about to lift, when I'm saying you need to have weight heavy, 85% or more, we're talking about the ATP, which is these quick energy stores. This is where um, athletes are able to lift and they're able to get stronger and not tear muscle fibers. So we avoid hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is basically that hold in tension, that go down slow. So think of a squat, you're gonna go down really slow well, we want to avoid that type of movement. If it's a deadlift, you're going to go up, especially with a hexagon bar. You go up and then you go down slow to uh, drop or, or rest the weight and then you go back up again. We want to avoid that type of movement. The reason why is because that's where it tears the muscle fibers and kids need time to recover. I love personally, Coach Ayers, JT Ayers in my personal life, love hypertrophy. I live in hypertrophy. I have big triceps and I want them bigger. I love this type of working out. My athletes should not be this way. I don't want my athletes to have big biceps, triceps. I don't want them to walk around and feel like, you know, I'm huge and look at my quads and this and that. No, 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 no. We do not want that. So most of my athletes are fairly tall, skinny, um, strong, very strong. And um, that's by design. So again, avoid weight. Maximum force is our goal. Muscle endurance is not. So we're doing three sets of three, three sets of four at 85%. We're doing three sets of two at 90%, 95%. We're not, you know, I'm not in my home gym, in my garage doing, I don't know, four sets of 20 to 25. And I'm getting that burn. We don't want to burn. That's what a bodybuilder wants. A bodybuilder wants the burn. So the bodybuilder's goal is to stimulate this microfibular and this, um, and both types of, uh, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. So there's two different types of hypertrophy. So they can do a very long workout. They're having like, they're, I mean, you go to the, when you used to be able to go to the 24 hour fitness and there's this guy with barely a shirt on and he's got a 25 pound weight and he's just going like this forever, you know, and he's just screaming at himself and he's just like this and then he flexes for half an hour and then he does it again. Like that guy just wants to be in hypertrophy. He wants swole. Well, the weight room doesn't have to be scary for you or for me or for our athletes. And this is not a, plan, a place to flex as a coach our egos about what we know and how we know. And, and just if you can take this principle of like keep it simple, um, the KISS method, that's really important here because you don't have to do 
tons of activities. We're not a CrossFit gym at Tribuco Hills High School. We're not training CrossFit athletes. I want my athletes fast. I want them to be able to be explosive, to put more force into the ground. The contact time is quicker. So how do we do all those things? How do we increase speed? Well, before I go on, um, I did not develop this, uh, I mean, by myself. Absolutely not. This is something that Barry Ross, who was Allison Felix's coach, um, when she was in high school, he wrote a, a fantastic book. Let's see, I got a picture of it. There it is, Underground Secrets to Faster Running. Um, this is not an easy book to find. You should go find it on uh, Amazon, and it might be expensive. I think there's a Kindle version that's much cheaper. This is a short book. It's really, really well done. Um, I mean, I have it right here. I'm literally constantly in this thing. I'm in this thing, I don't know, literally every other day. I just love going through it and highlighting things and talking about it. Um, Tony Holler, who's a big time coach in um, the Midwest called this feed the cats in the weight room. Feed the cats is the way that he trains his athletes. Uh, and um, there's a couple of like Ryan Flaherty's senior director of performance at Nike. He lifts his athletes like this, getting ready for the combine, things like that. And then Pavel, and I'm not even going to try to say his amazing Russian last name, but you know, he's legit because he wears jeans that don't fit with no belt. So, there you go. Power to the People is also a great book. And I have that on my shelf over here. Um, these are two good books to grab if you want more about what I'm talking about. And uh, they do a good job explaining kind of the intricacies and maybe even more of the science. But I want to get into how to do it. The science is great, but how do we do this? Okay. Earlier, I mentioned the idea that when we lift, we use we utilize the concentric movement, not the eccentric. In other words, we are going to lift up with the weight and we're going to drop it. We're going to avoid a hypertrophy where we hold in tension, use the negative, go down slowly. We want to avoid that. So when we deadlift or we are working out in the weight room, we want to keep work at a performance of no less than 85%. So if I say lift heavy, that's what I mean. You need to lift heavy. And this is how you do it. Heavy weight, low rep, high rest routine. Now, the high rest routine is going to ruffle some feathers. When your football coach at your high school walks in and sees kids sitting around, he's going to be furious. Um, that's happened to me. It doesn't happen to me anymore, but it has happened to me, especially in my younger years as a coach. Um, good luck explaining the science. Maybe take some screenshots of this. Uh, but... The idea is we do not want muscle failure. I lifted shoulders today. It's going to take me a week to lift shoulders again because Coach Harris wants big, massive, cool shoulders. Well, um, I want to go good at the beach. The um, My athletes, I don't care if they look good at the beach. I want them fast on the track. So concentric versus eccentric. The recuperation of the lactic acid because of the workout um, it did not produce either one of them. We are avoiding lactic acid buildup. We're avoiding that burn, swoles, the goal, size of the prize. No, 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 no. We're avoiding all that. And so it, when we call it the holy grail, I can lift my athletes Monday. They can work out and run a speed VMAX day or um, even a lactic acid day the next day. And my athletes lift right now. They're lifting three times a week. Right now we're going Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And my running workouts coincide with that. I don't have to think about what I did in the weight room and how much recovery. And we don't miss time on the track. And I think that's really important if you're thinking about how weight room and how um, things you do on the track can coincide. And there's been a nice marriage between them. They actually help one another. Um, so here's an athlete using a lot of weight. He goes up with the bar, concentric movement, drops the weight, avoids the eccentric. And there's a three by three, I'm sure that's at 90%. All right, so stay strength without mass. I've said this a lot of times, let me get in more into like why. So avoid the burn. We do not want to have our athletes feeling sore from the weight room. We don't want that. We want to increase that firing uh, the motor units that we talked about yesterday. And now why do they rest? So if I say um, heavy weight and low reps and high rest routine, well, a five minute rest period after a set of, let's say you went three by three at 95%. And I'll explain more in a little bit. 
Um, well, we're trying to replenish that phosphagen pool, which allows them to lift heavy and they can recuperate about 95% of their phosphagen pool within that energy storage system in five minutes. So my athletes will walk over, they'll deadlift three by three at 90% or three by two at 95, whatever we decide to do that day. And they will then go and they'll, and they'll do a plyo, a quick plyo. And then they'll, I tell them, get off your feet, sit. And so you'll come into my weight room and you'll see, I don't know, 35 to 50 kids sitting on the ground um, waiting and they're on their phones and they're checking Twitter and making TikToks. Um, so mass, not strength, is the goal of the bodybuilder. We don't want bodybuilders. We want strength without mass is the goal of the runner. Strength. Um, so swole is the goal, size of the prize? No. No, 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 no. Um, do your very best humbly to talk to your football coach or the like I the glorified JV assistant defensive back coach um tell him that the athletes do not need to gain weight and the NFL if they we're going to use that as an example it's full of people including um Patrick Mahomes, Christian McCaffrey, some of the fastest major league baseball players, um Olympic hopefuls um and Oregon track and field athletes they're utilizing this system and they're much better than your JV punt returner. So um, an analogy, it says two trucks down here. If I get two trucks, same, same size engine, same horsepower, same whatever, and one truck, has, the bed of the truck is empty, and the other truck, the bed of that truck is just full of debris, rocks, whatever. It's, it's full. Well, if I ask both those trucks, one with the bed empty, one with the bed completely full, and I said, let's go, let's have a race, which truck would you think is going to win? It's the truck that's lighter, that's going to have a lot easier time being fast. I know it's, the, the analogy breaks down, but just trying to put it in, inside your mind is, how are we lifting our athletes? So the anabolic response to heavy lifting. So the effects of anabolic hor hormones. So can you increase testosterone in the athlete? Yes, the IGF-1, the growth hormone. Yeah, we can build strength and muscles and bone density. We can help our athletes develop strength and athleticism in the weight room. And again, what we do on the track should correspond to what we do in the weight room, and they should help one another because my athletes, unfortunately, I think most track coaches are afraid of the weight room because what they do is when they go in there, we don't know what we're doing and I'm afraid they're going to get hurt. I'm afraid I'm going to do something that's going to, I mean, I, I really need to get my lactic stack capacity workout tomorrow or my speed endurance, whatever. I need to do handoffs and speed VMAX work. And I can't do that if football coach took all my football kids and we max squatted that day. And then they did 25 other exercises that were all great, but not good for being faster. So there's other benefits I wrote on here. Ironically, you see this more in female athletes which um, Barry Ross did with Allison Felix and, and my, my buddy Brian Kula at Valor Christian in Colorado. Predominantly, the girl athletes do this because the football has their own thing. But um, fat oxidation, um, immune function, cartilage growth, he's seen these um, anabolic hormones increase in his female athletes more than the male. And I think that had a lot to do with um, girls simply just don't lift weights. And they can though. And if they do, you're going to see a much greater ceiling out of your athletes. And I think that's all what we want. We want our athletes to reach their maximum potential. So this is what we do not want. Type 2 B, my, uh, muscle fibers, uh, the sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, 6 to 10 reps or more, lighter weight. Yeah, I'm swole. I feel sore. Look at my bicep. No, bad. Um, okay, we want this. One to five reps. 85%, 90%, 95%, we're going heavy. And I'll explain some examples of what we do and how it could be easier for you. Um, okay, so we developed something called the force number index. And the reason I developed this thing is because um, I saw my athletes really wanting to lift heavy, heavy weight. And the form broke down. Um, they started using their back and it scared me because now they were chasing a, uh, a max. And that's not fair if you're a 122 pounds and you're trying to deadlift something that a 180 pound kid's going to deadlift. So we said, all right, there needs to be some type of ratio that we need to celebrate and give the kids something to aspire to. And we call it the force number. You take the um, deadlift max and you divide it by their, um, 
their weight. Like I actually have a, a scale in my weight room and I walk over there and I weigh them. And we, so you get like Caden Sagoon, he's 145 pounds, but he can deadlift max 425. And his senior year, he was at 515 and he was about 152 pounds. Well, his force number at 2.9, um, he was over three. And that's, that's absurd. He's an 800 runner. And then our, our um, let's see, jumper, Kevin is a 400 runner, jumper, 100 runner, 100 runner, 800 runner, hurdler, hurdler. Like we have, um, you know, what's funny is, wow, they're like our best athlete right now is not even on here. This is two years ago. So he was a sophomore at the time. So you'll see that we, we encourage the kids not to lift or not to gain weight. We encourage them not even to lift as much as they possibly can. They're not comparing with one another. And we're high school kids. They're going to compare. They're not comparing to one another the amount of weight they're comparing their, um, the ratio between force applied to the ground based on their mass. And so you'll get a force number. And I'll explain kind of what these mean, but then we have the 85, 90, 95%. So um, they round like you're not going to get 361 on a hexagon deadlift bar. So we'll try to get the 360 or 380 or 405, something like that. And then here's a sheet that I'll have them write down. Um, it's very easy to keep track. Um, but we, we get very excited when kids uh, lift weight that coincides with um, their body weight. And if they start going up in body weight and their max stays the same, well, their number is going to go down and they get bummed out. So, so here, here's a general idea about when you're thinking about um, what the force number could do. 1.5 1, 1. Uh, as the ratio uh, is pretty good. You know, 2.0 is, is great. 2.5 is elite and 3.0, you're, you're world-class. And um, it's different for boys and girls. We've actually seen girls, um, it's very hard for them to get to the higher ratio. So a girl that has a 2.5, is, is that's world-class. And um, so you can kind of put it back and forth and... If you start with girls that are freshmen and as they're maturing and growing and you continue to lift this way, um, we're not, you're not going to see a decrease in speed because they're doing the right things in the right way. Okay. Why the deadlift? So I predominantly do the deadlift. We don't squat. And, um, that might be faux pas. That might be something that you're angry about right now. Um, that's fine. I mean, if you don't believe me, that's fine. Uh, we deadlift and we'd use the hexagon deadlift bars. Actually, you can see a picture. I have about 15 bars all around um, the gym right there. And they're easy to kind of put up against the wall. So the deadlift, more bang for our buck. The reason why I like deadlift is because it's easier to mimic the type of force we're applying to the ground. It's easier to kind of... Um, get the benefit of what I'm trying to do in the weight room with the track, with the concentric and eccentric. You can, there's Caden right there. You can go up, you can drop the weight and you can see that. I, I mean, you don't need a lot of room. These things are everywhere. And for freshmen, we start very light and we work on form. And then as time goes on, it's almost like a passage of youth. Um, you, you get to do more weight and quality over quantity every time. I feel like the, mu the muscles that we, get to do or get to have as like a corresponding benefit of the deadlift for mass specific for force purposes, uh, we get again, more bang for our buck. I mean, we get to quads, glutes, hamstrings, abdominals, calves, lower back. I mean, it's really, really good. And so quality over quantity, I'm not trying to do a thousand things in the weight room. So we deadlift. Can you do other things? I will tell you what you can do and what others are doing across the country um, I don't do much else. I don't do a lot of Olympic lifts. Um, and the reason why is because time and facility and numbers, I just, it's not in my favor. So I try to take care of what I can. So, um, the main, I think the topic that I wrote down as the title for this thing is how can you lift for speed? We don't have time and you don't have, um, facility use. It's, that's a problem for everybody. Well, um, a hexagon deadlift bar, that's $120 on Titan Fitness. And that's not a lot of money in the track and field world. In fact, $120 gets you like, I think a baton. You can ask uh, Steve Ringold at relaybatons.com. But 
Uh, and I'm just going to pause and pretend you guys are laughing at that. So, uh, Amazon has them. You can get it. You literally can get a hexagon deadlift bar, Amazon prime to you in two days. And it's not a huge big deal. Now I want to warn you, these bars are great. There is a limit. You can kind of see with like how much weight we can put on these things. Uh, you're going to have kids that are going to max that thing out and that's a bummer, but it's also a good thing. Um, so, uh, you can upgrade to that beauty. That's in my garage right now. That was $265 and that came straight out of my account because, um, it's beautiful. It's a work of art. Titan fitness is really cool. And, uh, but Amazon has them too. You can see that I can get a lot more weight on there. This bar right here is 52 pounds. I don't know why. Um, but the Amazon ones are 55 pounds. This one's 60 pounds and it doesn't feel like it. And, uh, I actually had a kid right here. He pulled that he literally, it's welded on there. He pulled it off when he was lifting. Scared me to death because um, that's dangerous. But he pulled it off and he's not doing, he's not pulling that thing off. So hexagon deadlift bar, I believe, especially the hex trap bar, you can use the single, just a barbell. You can use that. There, uh, a lot of people have. Allison Felix sure, sure did. The reason why I like this bar is you can do more weight. You can step into it. You're mimicking um, the movement and you can drop it and not be afraid of it. It's easier to keep form. Um, there's a video earlier of one of my kids lifting. He was barefoot. I do not recommend the kids going barefoot, but sometimes you have to choose your battles. And this kid was barefoot um, because he believed that he got a better lift because he had to pay attention to his feet and all that good stuff. So that was a battle I chose not to fight that day. And of course I got recorded and I put it on this presentation. So do with, do with that. What, what you want with that? So, um, let's see other exercises you can do. So you can do Olympic lifts kind of whenever, um, the reason why is because, and I know I've just said a whole lot about concentric and eccentric and lift heavy. Um, we're going to go for bar speed here. If you're going to do this type of work, like a power clean, a snatch split jerk, you're going for speed. That is, um, Christian McCaffrey. That's not a lot of weight. He could probably sit there and just start repping that out as bicep curls. Um, Christian is 6'2", and he's 200 pounds. He goes to Coach Brian Kula, who is um, his weight. They measure him at 200 pounds, and then when he leaves six months later, he is exactly 200 pounds. They do not add weight. They want to add speed. And so, i got to fly in here. Um, speed, bar speed, if you're, if you're going to complement the hexagon deadlift bar with Olympic lifts, um, Think about bar speed and think about a uh, proper movement. So other supplementary exercises uh, like unilateral and bilateral lifts. So I want to make sure I mention this. There's Coach Kula coaching his athletes. Um, he loves box squat. You can notice that it's really not a lot of movement uh, up and down. It's working on kind of like those quick muscle fibers. Um, it's still within the type 2B muscle fiber range. Um, and here's some examples, step downs, hip thrusts, reverse hypers, um, pin squat, box squat. I don't do these. And I told you earlier, it's because I just don't have the facility, but I did, I, I kind of feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't explain that you can do other things. And I'm a lot of people probably on this, watching the zoom call, like doing those things and that's fine. Um, but again, within the mass specific force, you need to ensure that you're doing these things. I mean, if we, if they got rid of these power uh, lift bars and he just went all the way down and he's at the 90 degree angle and he has to go all the way back up. That's not making him faster. And, um, so we have to be careful and cautious. And if we do believe it's making him faster, well, the next day is ruined and we have to think about, um, we can't do an exercise that ruins tomorrow. And if we do, and we only get seven days in the week, we have to think about not just the plyometrics we're doing or how we're doing it or whatever. We need to be careful about what we're doing on the track, how it complements the weight room and so forth. Um, so moving forward, plyometrics. These are great. Now I also want to say that sprinting is the best plyo. If you are having your kids sprint, you need to pay attention to that. If your kids are hurtling, that's a sprint and that's a, that's a plyometric. So the sprinting is the best plyo. So, um, as we sprint, it should not be an addition, but, or it should be an addition to the plyo we do in the weight room, not replace it. So plyos, 
we load the muscle to accumulate and store energy. Then we, and I slowed this down so you can get a better grasp about the idea of it. And we unload the energy in the opposite direction. So we can kind of cheat gravity in little bits. Um, Barry Ross says, performing a plyo during recovery tricks the body in creating greater, greater levels of energy stores to compensate for the expected increase in demand. So I'll, I'll tell you, what they're doing right now is actually clips that we took um, after they actually did a deadlift. So what does that mean? Well, here you go. Here's an example of a week in season. Monday, we ran. It was a hard day. It was our acceleration day. Whatever you do, um, Brian Fitzgerald, mentor of mine, a great friend of mine is going to be right after this call, do a lot more talking. And if he's on this call, I'm sorry, I'm putting you on the spot. But I have full confidence you're going to deliver. Uh, he was going to talk about the way that you can kind of figure out uh, when to when to put certain types of running workouts in a seven day week. Well, let's say you run on Monday. You can. Our kids will deadlift three by three at ninety percent. They will lift three times ninety percent. They'll go up, drop the weight, go up, drop the weight, go up again, drop the weight. They'll walk over and I'll have them do three hurdle hops three times. And I space the hurdles out and they go right over them three times. Then they go sit for five minutes. So kind of right at the beginning of that that uh, five minute rest period for that phosphagen pool to kind of start replenishing, we trick it and we do apply metric. Tuesday, we run. Wednesday is our dual meet. And then Thursday is our recovery. I'll have them, led, I'll have them deadlift. And we're not doing much on the track. We're doing like rudiment series A and working on our hips and just trying to like recover a little bit from the meet because everybody ran the four by four on my team. I think it's good for the soul. And um, we deadlift on Thursday. And Friday is our pre-meet because Saturday is invitational. You don't have an invitational, we're deadlifting. So you can deadlift three to three times a week. Now I want to say this is I try to uh, pre-season like January in a normal season, January, February, um, we're like three times a week. I scale it down to two. And then, um, we deadlifted when we were in three, when we were in three fifteen six the other, you know, two years ago and Tim was on the speakers yelling at my kids to run fast. And it was amazing. Um, we deadlifted on Tuesday and then we ran Friday and Saturday. Allison Felix deadlifted on uh, Monday. And then on, I think it was a Thursday. She set the national record for her age group in high school. You can deadlift, and my kids actually, and I've experimented with this, they want it, they crave it. And when I say we're not gonna, we're not gonna lift anymore, um, it's, it almost seems like, it's not even just mental. Physiologically, it seems like they're not uh, fully prepared to run, and so we just keep doing it. And um, now I had, I may say we're going three by four, 85%, um, but that's the way we lift. We still lift heavy, and the kids uh, are, are much better for it. Within this system, you can kind of put where you want to do this system, this uh, lifting anywhere in the week, depending on your, it's up to you how you schedule your running workouts You can, and, and when your track meets are. Um, some people have dual meets on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays. I hope we have a Saturday meet this year somewhere. But if that happens, you can kind of input these workouts wherever and you don't have to worry about the recovery the next day. And so again, we'll deadlift on Monday and Tuesday. We're, we're running. Um, if we have a dual meet on Thursday, then, you know, I will deadlift them on Monday. We'll run Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday's our pre-meet and then I'll lift them Saturday. And, uh, maybe we get only one in that week, but we're going to get it in. And, um, it works. So hopefully this is flexible. How long does this take with the system that I just outlined? Um, I can get kids out in and out in 22 minutes. And I have 15 bars. I basically put two to three kids at every bar based on how much weight they typically do at their max. And um, we can get a lot of kids in that weight room or outside and everybody's lifting, everyone's going. I can get in and out in 30, 35 minutes. And it's pretty cool um, that I like it that way. So I tried to talk as fast as I could. I hope it wasn't too much. Um, again, if you're, we're all in this together and it takes a village, I'm a direct recipient of great coaches, including, like I said, Brian Fitzgerald and Brian Kula and even some of the people that I mentioned earlier. And um, I, I can't do any of these things unless these people invested in me. So I would love if you have any questions to help. Um, at JTRs is my Twitter, coachjtiers at gmail.com. There's a picture of my son about six years ago. Um, 
trying to <laughs> not lifting that weight, but um, love to help out and answer questions. We can answer questions right now. And uh, on Coach Tube, I did a lot, probably better job than I explained this about what it looks like to do this, implement this system. So, um, yeah, any questions you have? I think now is the time, Tim. Let me stop sharing. By all means, we've got tons of them. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, first off, we've got several JV football coaches that have oh. several questions. Oh no! <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. That's all right. That's all right. They'd like to compare their biceps with yours, is what. Oh, say. any day. Uh, all, right. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's start. Let's get a little technical right off the bat here from Coach Gray. Here it says: So, how does MSF apply to the force velocity curve, and what's the recommended speed of the bar? I don't know how to answer that question. So yeah. if they are, if they are, let me, let me try to answer this. If, um, if they're deadlifting heavy weight, I don't care about bar speed. Um, I do care though, if they start to go up and they're holding it and I basically have a two second rule. If a kid is struggling for two seconds, I say drop and the kid just drops it. And if they, if we're doing three by three at 90% and they only get three by two, um, or they only get two reps on the last set, that's fine. That's still good work. Not every day your kids are going to be able to lift as much as you hope or they hope, but it's about quality, not quantity. And so for bar speed with the Olympic lifts, um, I don't know the answer to that because I don't have uh, data to show you. Okay. So here's a good one. So year round, are you doing deadlifts year round? If you've got a kid that's a track athlete, says uh, Coach Rick here, if you've got a kid that's a track athlete, are you doing deadlifts year round if you've got him for all that time? Hundred percent. And um, I have a lot of kids that are on my team. To make my team, you have to make a qualifying standard per event. Um, I don't have cuts, but our numbers would be astronomical. We would have five hundred athletes out on our track, and it's PE credit, so a lot of kids are trying to get that. So to avoid that, we have qualifying marks. So kids want to get fast. So we have kids that are freshman year don't make the team. They do off-season track and field with me in sprints, and they make the team their next year, which is harder, which is a great accomplishment. So, yes, we deadlift uh, year-round. And then, that, well, that leads into this one. The last question just got asked. Uh, do you taper at the end of the year, either decrease the weight or decrease the number of reps or decrease the number of sessions towards the championship um, season? Yes. So we do not decrease in weight. In fact, the kids are getting stronger. We might even go up. Um, it depends on the individual. And we probably preseason with no meets. We go three times a week in season, two times we'll deadlift a week. And, um, towards like the postseason league finals, CIF prelims, finals, masters state, we're deadlifting one time a week. Okay. Uh, do you ever, this is uh, coach Martinez. Do you ever stagger stance with the deadlift? Oh, that's a great question. Not with heavy weight. Um, and I think he's applying is that you basically have your feet go toe to heel. You even can mimic what they would look like in the blocks, so to speak. Um, no, we don't go heavyweight. If we're going to do something silly, uh, like I want to put lightweight on there and I want them to go into a toe to heel type stance, stagger my feet, and then they bend down and jump up and almost do, I mean, it's kind of like a, um, it's almost like an Olympic lift at that moment. But no, I don't stagger my feet when we use heavy, heavy weight. It's too hard. Too hard on the probably the front of the knee, and I don't want them in that position. Well, that's good. I'm going to throw this one that came in earlier here. So, the kid first walks into the weight room. How does he learn to lift? So, I assume it's talking about the deadlift. So, what's that progression like? There's two things you can do. One, you depending, and it's up to your discretion, you have to figure out what the kid's capable of. So, you may want to give them a 45 pound dumbbell and say, We're going to just practice the movement of. Um, squatting down and coming back up, squatting down and doing the set to 10. They're not gaining anything, but they're learning the movement. The other thing I do is sometimes I'll put in our weight room, especially with the bumpers, all the plates are the same size. There's not the same thickness. So a 10 pound or even a 25 pound um, bumper plate is the same, you know, dimensions of a 45 pound. So we'll put the bar up there and I'll just have them practice going up and down, up and down. And um, I wasn't able to put that in there, but to have a kid come into the weight room and you have them lift at 85%, we put weight on there and I have them do a practice and they, they warm up utilizing the concentric and, and eccentric movements a few times. And I'm talking like 
five times. It's real easy. Up and down, up and down, up and down. Move away, a couple minutes, come back. And then we start adding bigger weight. So um, I, I am always hesitant about putting a freshman on big bars. I don't want that. I'd rather them run more. I'd rather work on plyometrics. I'd rather work on, because if you can teach a freshman how to utilize the right movement, well, the next three years are going to be much, much better um, for that athlete because they're going to get the better gains, not weight gains, speed gains. Uh -huh. Well, here's one related to that. It asks about uh, Coach Rogers asking about uh, groups. So you say you group them in groups of three. Is it all kids of equal age and ability? Are they freshman, sophomore, senior together? What's that grouping? It has to do with the weight because we don't want to put weight on and off the bar. It takes too much time. Now, why two to three kids per hexagon deadlift bar? Because they only have a five-minute recovery period. And typically, you can have a kid um, – you can have a kid deadlift, go to his plyo, or the other kid hops on the bar, starts doing his thing. That kid, first kid's resting, second kid goes through his progression, he starts resting, third kid goes through his progression. Now it's time for the first kid to come. Now the one thing you're gonna have, because we all have these athletes, is you're gonna have these hungry kids that don't wanna wait five minutes. And you have to force them to wait that five minutes. And then you're gonna have kids that wanna spend 25 minutes doing nothing. And so you have to watch out for those kids too. But typically with groups of two to three, be smart, put kids that can do the weight, take a senior captain and go with those other two kids. And you may have to put weight on and off the bar, but you have accountability, create a culture where kids are helping one another get faster. And that has to do with what, you know, what you do with their groupings. Okay. So here's coach Rogers question. Do you lift in cycles? And if so, how many weeks are the progressions? And how much do you increase sets or reps as the weeks go on? The you know, idea is your three-week progression, one-week recovery, increasing one rep. So what's your cycle? So that kind of – the cycle would mirror my running, um, you know, micro cycles, I guess, where we sometimes – like we'll, if we're – especially the kid is with me for months and months and months, um, I'll give them time off. We do not – so basically, I would say August, we're lifting three times a week, and we do that all the way until December. We have these natural progressions because of the public school system. So Thanksgiving, week off. December, two weeks off. Spring break, week off. Um, and I give them complete, you know, you're gone. Bye. I don't want, I don't want to see you. And when they come back, we get right back into it. So um, – this year, especially since we're training so much longer and the season so much longer, I've had to force myself to give the kids more of a break. But we deadlift and we utilize the system, you know, not kind of kind of just go. And I don't focus too much on that. Now the weight, how much we put on the bars, all has to do with the individual kid. Um, you may have a kid that is is go, goes up in weight pretty quickly. Um, I'm always hesitant. I always say things like. Man, you're lifting. Does that feel like 90%? No, I, I'm doing it really easy. Okay, let's 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 work off this percentage and this max for another week, and then let's up the max, 10, 15 pounds. And then we'll work on that for a while. I'd rather them work with good quality weight rather than be too quick to add weight just for the sake of it, and uh, they're finding themselves getting hurt. Very good. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you worked with, uh, you just came from a practice, I think it said, uh, with younger kids. So what's the earliest you would have a kid doing work in the weight room? Oh, okay. So I have four kids of my own, um, 11, two nine-year-olds and, and an eight-year-old. And then them and their, I think we had, we had 48 kids out there at the park today doing youth stuff and just an hour of learning, you know, movement and speed. And it was fun. Um, none of those kids are going to lift. Uh, my children will not start lifting until high school. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to do body weight stuff. Um, absolutely. I mean, they're, they're doing core, they're moving, they're doing plyometrics, they're jumping. I'm teaching them how to fall. They're barefoot most of the time, um, in the grass. Cause we can do that in California. Can't do that anywhere else, especially Texas. So, um, I personally, my preference is I'm not in a hurry to have P uh, like pre puberty type adolescents lifting weights. Um, I don't think it's healthy. I think there's so much more we can do. Make the kids run fast. If they run fast, they'll get faster. They don't need to hit the weight room until probably they're sophomores, freshmen or sophomores in high school. 
So do you have a benchmark for freshmen to de uh, determine whether their time is now to go into the weight room? Uh, everybody goes in the weight room. Who's putting 85%, 90% of their max? Uh, I do not have a benchmark has to do with the kid who is ready. And we make a big deal about it. It's a passage of youth. Like um, you've earned this. Now go forth and get faster. And um, we're really patient with it too. We want the kids to be able to, and we know the kids. I mean, there's a 13 year old in my freshman class. There's also a 16 year old in my freshman class. We gotta be smart about who we put on the weights. And, um, but I like when the kids are hungry for the weight room. Very good. Here's a procedural question. Do you keep the records or do the kids keep the records of their lifts? And is it electronic or on paper? On well, paper, it says, yeah. Rank, record, publish, always. I record everything. It's outside the window of my classroom because we're hybrid. No one can see it, so it's on the front of our website. Um, every kid knows every other kid's uh, force number. And I we do the same thing for the 40-yard dash. We do the same thing for... Um, the 10 meter fly, 30 meter fly, 100 meter fly, 23 second drill, anything we do, I love to rank record publish because now you have accountability and you have people celebrating one another because they're seeing them get better. It's cool when a 112 pound Filipino kid deadlifts 400 pounds and it's right on your window or right on the website and everyone walks over and is super excited. And then I put it on Instagram. So to answer your question, I print them, but I'm a big believer in Google Docs. So I guess everything that I put on Google Docs, Google technically owns. So they own all my force number information, I guess. But yeah, I I take the best part of my practices are coming back into my classroom or coming to my desk right here and typing out numbers and putting them on spreadsheets. Love it. Are the kids actually writing that down in the weight room? Or are you are they telling you and you're writing it down? Uh both. Both. We're um we're in there together. And so um I think if there's too many kids for me to keep 100% accountable, so if they can keep themselves accountable, so I've given them the power for that and the responsibility of that. Um, but they're excited to come over and tell me, Coach, um, I just lifted a lot of weight. I feel really good about it. I'm like, really? Oh, man, okay, let's up. Let's go measure. Let's go weigh yourself. Let's write it down. And um, they constantly are aware of it. Yeah, I, I have. it's on the window in the weight room, and it's on the website, so the kids all know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Okay, Coach Burke says, since you don't max, could you integrate VBT as a guide to weight selection? Yes. Um, however, it's much easier for me to uh, make a determination. Just me, not my assistant coaches. It's just me. It's not overwhelming. It's actually pretty easy. And I enjoy the one-on-one -on -one connection I have with individual athletes to help them um, reach their ceiling, especially in the weight room. Okay. You did mention earlier that the deadlift is the primary lift that you do, but yes. that may be a procedure or just a, the facilities. If you were a coach of an individual athlete and you have all the time and everything you could use in the weight room, what other the lifts would you do? The Olympic lifts that you saw that I detailed out, I would utilize those um, more, I think, but not much. I'm pretty happy with the results. Um, I think I would definitely, if I had all the time in the world, I would have a, a, a massage therapist in there and I would have a, um, you know, an ice bath, you know, whatever Oregon has at, at their facility. So I think to answer your question, um, I don't think I would add too much more. Um, I'm, I'm, we get great results. It's, I mean, obviously the Olympians are going to have a lot better time because of the facilities and the resources they have, but we're doing pretty good. We're a high school. That's for sure. All right. Uh, Coach Delgado says, can you talk about a warm up routine prior to max lifting? Um, okay. So I mentioned it earlier and I did not put this in the presentation. Uh, when the kids walk into the weight room, we put most of the time a 45 pound plate on the hexagon deadlift bar and everybody is going up and down concentric eccentric about five times. They do that a few times, three or four or two or three rather. It, I'm not a huge, I don't really care. I just like them to get ready for the movement before we start adding weight. And then I tell them, today we're going at 85%. Today we're going at 95%. Today we're going at 90%. Whatever whatever you, you decide to do based on what you see in the athletes and you think you need. Um, and we stick to those percentages. 
Okay, here's a fair question. Uh, weighing female athletes, do you do that in public or do you do that in <laughs> private? So I can't answer this question with complete integrity. I only coach boys. Okay. However, um, coach Brian Kula, who utilizes this in Colorado, he coaches girls and boys, mostly, mostly girls. And um, he weighs them. And I obviously there's going to be a whole lot there. Uh, you, be smart. Okay. Um, let's get back to this uh, foot, uh, new football people. We're going to get in this eventually here. So you know, an athlete gains 20 pounds of mass, but his force number stays the same. Do you view that as the neutral change? And maybe that would be important for football as an improvement. Um, if they're, so if their if their hexagon deadlift bar is going up, if their deadlift is going up and their weight goes up and their force number stays the same, um, they're probably still fast. Now we want to see the force number go up though. So staying there, it's gonna be tough. Um, you add 20 pounds, that's gonna be a lot harder to run down the track. So if you're if the kid is running all year round and you're lifting them, um, and the kid's running fast all year round, it doesn't take a long, you know, well, we saw this. I mean, I've had kids come out in uh, December and they're like, I'm ready for track and they've done nothing since March. Well, a lot of those kids gain 20 pounds off shamrock shakes and Cheetos. And so they're, uh, they're hurting. It took them a lot. It's taken them a long time to get back into sprinting and being fast. So um, I'd be weary of that. Kids are going to gain weight. Um, and it's going to fluctuate because they're, especially the boys, my gosh, I mean, they can, a kid probably can show up, you know, 20 pounds heavier and then, than he's ever been. And then later in the afternoon, he's only 10 pounds heavier. I mean, that that's possible. Right. So, um, yeah, I would like to see the, I like to see the, maybe the, the data on that with individual kids. Um, but 20 pounds, is a lot of, a lot of extra weight. All right. The cross country coaches are in on us now here. It says your 800 runner. Uh, that you did, did he have noticed any decrease in cross country performance? I think uh, that was the one that was lifting so well. Yeah. Oh, okay. So that kid did not run cross country and, um, he, he should have, I would have loved him. Coach Clemens is our distance coach and he's a great friend of mine. He would have been great, but the kid just wanted to be with his friends and wanted to be an off season track. So we did a lot of extra stuff. Um, no. Your athletes should not see a decrease. They have to apply force into the ground too for a long period of time. Kids, cross country runners, I hope this doesn't, you know, make anybody upset, but I'm not saying it. Barry Ross said it. This is for anybody that runs a 10K and below. Maybe he says more. I have to look it up. Grab his book and see what he says. Your cross country athletes, deadlift them. Deadlift them this way. Um, my gosh, those kids, they're skinny kids. Their force numbers are going to be great. They're 105 pounds and they're going to be deadlifting 300 pounds. That's a good force number. And your kids are going to be strong and they're going to be able to have a, a lot easier time running by applying force in the ground for a long period of time. All right. This is uh, from Coach Stevenson. Have you explored Cal Dietz hand-assisted safety bar bilateral squat for sub-maximal weight in addition or an assist instead of death lifts. Death uh, lifts. no, I love Cal Dietz too. Um, no, but him and I do share the RPR. I mean, we both are big proponents of that. So, um, I don't know how to answer the question. The answer is no. no. Okay. Here's a good one. Uh, other coaches. So how do other sports training affect your training? So the example, the volleyball coach teaches a different type of weight training. Do you right. try to incorporate their training? Or do you just say, this is the way we do it? Choose your battles. Um, at my school right now, and I do this because I time all the 40-yard dashes at every single male sport. It doesn't matter if it's soccer, volleyball. Um, we time as I, tens of thousands 40-yard dashes I time. I put my free lap device there, and I just time them over and over and over and over again. Um, the 16 fastest kids in the school are all with me right now, which makes the 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 football coach really upset football players are not getting faster they're fast they stay fast they don't get faster and um we had a sophomore kid run 424 the other day with the free lap device which is very very fast he's a sophomore and i was very happy with it and his coach was happy with it he plays football but he hasn't been doing football up until 
five weeks ago. So he's been with me since August. So it's helped his speed tremendously. So it was very good that you didn't have a plug for Steve to sell free lap devices. That was good. I like that. Oh, should I say that? Go to uh, OnTrack doc on track and field com. Now, now, now we're, we're not, uh, not promoting. <laughs> uh, look, we're, we're going to run out of time here. So a couple of quick questions is, do you have a website or YouTube page where you can give a breakdown on the lifting technique? Yes. Um, coach tube. If you go to coach tube and type in my name or mass specific force, um, I go really, really in depth. Brian Kula did it with me. Um, we even take an entire, we take an athlete that's on the team currently right now through the entire routine. You can watch the entire workout in its entirety. It's about, I think with cuts, it's about 11 minutes. Um, we go further deep into all of this. So you got a, the best version in 35 minutes. I think it was 35 minutes. And um, yes, and if you need help, just go to Twitter, reach out to me. Um, again, I said it earlier, we're all in this together and I want to help. That was uh, the next question. We'll finish on this. Uh, your email address? Uh, Coach JTAirs at gmail.com or Twitter is just JTAirs. And uh, you can go to coachairs.com or tribucotrack.com. And uh, I'm sure there's Instagram somewhere. No, yeah, your website has everything in the world on this from your tra team and all the rest of that stuff. So that'd be oh, a great place to start. So. Uh, all right, so we're, we're going to have to stop there because we're at 7.35 and we, we need to get ready for the next one too. So thank you so much. We want to thank JT. I, you know, JT, I know you're busy as heck and uh, you're, you're a regular classroom teacher and all the rest of that stuff. So uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, it, yeah. It great. Just great. Good stuff. Thanks. So uh, thank JT. Pleasure. And uh, again, so JT mentioned it. Uh, if JT's man, then, then uh, Brian Fitzgerald's the godfather. And uh, he's Amen. coming up at eight o'clock. Uh, Brian is probably the, you know, if not uh, in, in any conversation of the, the 10 greatest high school sprint coaches of all time, Brian's going to be in that conversation. And he's coming out at eight o'clock. Now, you have to go back and re register for the session. Go back to runmountsack.com and pick up that session. So uh, you can do that. And we'll be back at eight o'clock. And then I'd like to remind you that we're coming back tomorrow night. We move to the field events. And uh, just as qualified as JT obviously is, the people tomorrow night are great. Uh, Nick Garcia, who is one of the greatest high school, uh, not just throws coaches, but lifting coaches. He's an IAAF level five coach and a USATF level three. You don't get any higher than either one of those designations. He's going to join us at 630 and talk about rotational teaching progression for the shot and discus. Then eight o'clock, uh, Doug Nordquist, who's a former Olympian, uh, fifth in the Olympic Games in 84, a national champion, has a PR of seven, eight and three quarters. I say that like that because I introduced him at seven, eight and a half a couple of years ago and I never heard the end of it. So he has gone seven, eight and three quarters. And uh, he, he is a great classroom teacher and you'll enjoy his presentation. He's entitled to help. I have to coach the high jump. So uh, those will be tomorrow night. And that reminds you that uh, all our videos will be posted within 48 hours on our website at runmouthsack.com. So once again, JT, thank you so much and thank you everybody else. And hopefully we'll see you at 8 o'clock.